Moore, uh, I'm the lead engineer at Social Tables. Um, a little bit about us, uh, a little bit about this slide right here. Um, in going about this talk, um, one of the things that I realized is that for a lot of people, remote work means that everyone in the office is remote. Uh, and for this talk, I'm really talking about remote employees at like a very centralized company. Um, so at Social Tables, we're a pretty flat organization. Um, we are doing tons of like quick one-on-ones, full hand meetings. We're all in an office in DC. Um, but my wife um, is in international development. Um, this is me and my wife in Swaziland. Um, and so thus from time to time, she's gone for like months on end in foreign countries. Um, not the third world, because that's a Soviet era term. Um, the developing world. Um, and Swaziland's actually really safe. But um, its internet con connectivity does really suffer. But this is who I am. Um, MC Whittemore on GitHub and Twitter. Follow me. Um, what is Social Tables? Social Tables is event planning software. Um, we are somehow involved in the planning of this event. I'm not really sure. I just got told that earlier today. Um, so we make software that plans these kinds of events. Um, what is Swaziland? Swaziland is a country in southern Africa. It's not the one inside of South Africa. It's the one between Mozambique and South Africa. Um, it's the highest AIDS rate in the world. Um, arguably, that's because there are more honest people than other people's. Um, that's a little bit Swaziland, and that's why my wife is there. Um, here is where on the continent of Africa you can find Swaziland. Um, and today, Swaziland looks much more like this than like our straw um, shack I saw you a couple seconds ago. Which, by the way, that door is like this height. Um, and so you have to like crawl in. And so that if someone was trying to steal in your house, you could just mallet them over the head. Um, cool Swaziland fact. Um, so I've spent nine months of my life now working remotely. Um, the first six of it, I quit my job because of it. Um, it was absolutely horrible. Again, I worked for a very like centralized team at that time in Atlanta. Um, and while we talked about how to interact with people, we never really worked on it. Um, so. Um, coming to social tables and knowing that this was in my future, we started talking about a lot. How do you introduce something, some way for an entity to help the communication process, right? Because if every day of your life is about interacting with a person at your office, and then suddenly that person isn't there, and there is nobody else working remotely, your default behavior isn't go get on Google Hangouts and have a meeting. Your default behavior is talk to the next guy. Uh, talk to the next guy. Uh, and so we, we, we came up with this concept called I, Matthew, um, in which we literally turned myself into a robot. Um, it is this I, Matthew, not iPhone Matthew. Um, and so for the next three months, I was a, I was a robot at our company. Um, this is me in some meeting. It looks like I'm leading it, but that's just because that's where they had to put me. I'm not leading it. Um, this is me hanging out with one of our salespeople. Um, and then this is me at our weekly, ha weekly um, all hands. Um, so again, like here you see me, this is the metaphysics part, like literally being a robot. Um, I can't walk around the office, so someone has to drag me around the office. Um, we didn't, we like thought of this like two days before I left, so we like had all these crazy ideas about using Johnny Five um, and like whipping up something to make me be able to move around, but that didn't happen. So you are suddenly a quadriplegic um, for all intents and purposes um, inside the office. Which really raised some interesting problems for me after about three months um, because I can't like just have that meeting. Um, people still, um, still thought of me as that entity and still came to me as that entity, but I couldn't come to them. Um, so, slight little downfall about this way. It'll eventually make the person feel, I mean, like they're a robot. Um, so, we're going to talk about these five things. Um, but first, I want to just quickly talk about why people should work remotely. Because I actually, as much as I've struggled with it, I think it's a really, it's a thing, especially in our field, that we can take advantage of. Um, there's the whole argument about productivity. I'll get into that. Um, I think we live in an amazing world, um, and 
we can work anywhere for the most part. And I know so many people um, who feel bound to their small you know, worlds, wherever they live, no matter how large or small the city. And it's just not true anymore. Um, so the fun pictures of lions and tigers and bears. Um, these are the, the reasons why you should work remotely. Um, there are only 600 wild dogs in the world, um, about. And I got to see one, um, actually a lot. There are lots of crocodiles, um, giraffes, baboons, um, and of course the obvious one, which is work-life balance. Um, yeah, there's you know going to remote parts of the world and seeing things that you know only small parts of humanity sees. Um, but there's also raising your kids, um, which I'm not yet to, but will be to in the next couple of years. Um, and I mean, my my wife works remotely in foreign countries, so that's going to fall more on me. Um, and like, we should be figuring out how to do that better. Uh, so, um, so to meetings. Um, what does it take to be a robot in a meeting? Um, we're going to go through these basically as problems and then quasi solutions because I haven't really found solutions. Um, number one problem with being a robot in a meeting is that microphones aren't ears. Um, you've all probably seen this with conference calls. Like, you start talking over each other. Um, but again, if you're the only robot in the meeting, no one else realizes that you can't hear. Um, so if you're working with remote workers, remember, they can't focus on you. And so if we're having a conversation and someone else is trying to talk, I'm hearing all three of you talking at the same, as the same person. Um, so how we sort of dealt with trying to solve that problem um, is we introduced hip chat. Uh, so we actually do a lot of our, we started doing a lot more of our communication over chat. We had used chat traditionally, but in much more like siloed ways and with hip chat, not to like give Atlassian like PR, but with hip chat, you can just like open random rooms and just start dialogues. Um, and so meetings would often have chat rooms. Um, brainstorming, the next big problem, um, I think, um, especially for me at least, I'm a whiteboarder. Um, I'm assuming an arrays of people in this room who loves to whiteboard. Um, yeah, so like, there aren't great whiteboarding solutions. There definitely aren't great whiteboarding solutions over 3G internet. And there definitely aren't great whiteboarding solutions over 3G internet, which is what there is in Swaziland, when everyone gets out of work and starts using their cell phones. Um, and so, what we ended up doing um, sometimes was having a whiteboard and having like a camera pointed, you know, my, my robot pointed at the whiteboard, and I would be like, oh yeah, you should draw the box bigger. And like, that's the kind of conversations. Um, so whiteboarding is definitely a problem. Um, the best solution I think that we came up with was just straight up using Google Docs. Um, again, this is, you know, obviously just trying to recreate a whiteboard. Um, but I'm, I more mean Google Drive, like being able to just type and like putting ideas down. Um, so um, solution sort of obviously not as good as a whiteboard. Um, so focus and distractions. Um, one of the reasons I think that we like to think remote work is great is that there's a lot of research that says that engineers are productive when they're not distracted um, and that in the office you get distracted all the time. Um, there's this book that I just found out about in my research that I want to read called Why Programmers Work at Night. Um, and you know, there's, Georgia Tech has done a bunch of research on this and it like, the amount of time that it takes an engineer, um, it takes really any creative um, worker to get back to where they were is ridiculous. And so we talk about remote work as this great sort of way of solving this problem. Um, but I think we often forget that at least in the case of Swaziland, there are like chickens that decide to sleep in your coop. I mean, in your house as their coop. So like one day I woke up and this chicken just wouldn't leave my house. Um, yeah, that was fun. Um, in Swaziland, there are also, all my slides, um, there are also monkeys that decide to eat your avocados. And at least for the first couple of weeks that I was there, I was just like, this is a monkey in my backyard eating my avocados. And every time I would hear it, I would just be like, monkey, get the camera, go take a picture. 
which actually only happened once, and this is not from that, because that picture is really blurry. Um, so, I mean, there's things to think about when you're, we're working remotely, um, that, like, obviously you don't have your boss walking in or, you know, somebody else walking in and asking you a question, but, I mean, you do still have people interrupting you. And when you're working six hours ahead of schedule, um, as I was in Swaziland, your coworkers become an interesting interruption because they all get into work at, say, your 4 p.m., um, which is, at least traditionally for me, my most productive time, and is traditionally for them their least productive time. And so chats explode, like, emails start getting sent out, and, like, these ideas that I've been working on in, like, my siloed little universe in Swaziland just suddenly get smashed. Um, fun things, though, you do learn when all of your coworkers wake up. Uh, and, and if they check their email when they get out of bed, um, when you're working that far ahead. Um, for instance, Don, who's our CEO, gets up like three hours ahead of most people, and Ed, who's actually in the room, gets up right about the time he gets to work. So, so. Um, lastly, um, for just general things, um, motivation, I think, is really hard um, when you're this kind of remote worker. Um, and this is, this is one that actually I think really kind of hits home for me. Um, we, we are, we're sitting alone. Um, you're like working on this great product, you know, you can think of sort of like those entrepreneurs who are like just starting something. Um, and that's like, that's great, but when you start to get a little bit bigger, you have this, you know, we're working on this together. And once you get siloed into a foreign, con like a continent far, far away, you can no longer have that interaction in the back and forth. And like the motivation to make your code better, to like iterate on your product, to you know, be a good employee starts to diminish. Um, so the thing that I think we found worked best was sort of going back to more of that like early stage startup, that early like there's only one or two of you working on this product, and like saying you own this. So that when I woke up at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, and got to work, like I had my work. Um, and like this is what I was doing, um, so that you know obviously that that silos you more, and there are problems with that, metaphysical fun problems with that, um, but it also does let you own something, and I think ownership is really key. Um, task management is really hard unless you have someone who's really really far ahead of their scheduling, um, because sometimes I would just like get through like. 10 stories, and then all of the work that was scheduled would be done, and it would be like three, a, you know, 5 a.m. in the East Coast, and no one's waking up. Um, which is why eventually we moved to more of an oriented, um, like ownership-oriented structure. Um, that said, like, I really think the problem with this single remote worker is that we don't think about it. Um, we sort of, to use this picture as an analogy, think work is work. We think a road is a road. We think that like every time it's the same. Um, and especially in the United States, I think we define work as coming into the office and typing um, and letting our managers or our coworkers or whoever we have peer pressure from um, see us typing. Um, I mean, obviously, like, we think of it as a lot more than that, but like, if we define it down to like, the bare minimums, I think that's what we think work is. Um, but once like, work is completely remote, once work is you know, not possible to be you in a room typing, um, I think we have to start really getting down to like, what is work um, and like, what that means, um, and what that means in your company. Um, so, we, you know, we've spent some time and we created this I, Matthew concept. We actually have a new um, remote worker who she's just moved to, um, to Colorado. Um, and so we have an I, Claire now. Um, and and it, it's definitely something that works, um, definitely something that helps. Um, but I think if you're ever in a place where you're thinking about siloing yourself, remote working yourself in a large, not even large, just like in a centralized company, um, in a non-distributed company. It's something that, that really needs to be thought of um, because if everyone on the team is not 
completely about trying to solve this work problem, your remote worker will be alienated, um, no matter how much you don't want that to be true. Um, and eventually, like what happened to me before, they'll just leave. Like, it's really easy, especially if they're in the United States, to interview while you're remote working. Um, really easy. Um, so, things to think about. Um, that said, I would love questions, answers, and discussions. There's a sweet, small group, so like, stories about, I don't actually know where we are in time, but, um, um, some questions if anyone has them. Uh, but we can also look at more fun pictures of Swaziland. Um, that said, baboons, by the way, are like my least favorite animal. Um, well, it doesn't help that I was there during baboon mating season. Um, <laughs> but like, they would just like throw like random seeds at us. Like, we, so we were in like, so if you look at this, this picture, the end of the presentation, you can actually, this like, it's called a combi, this like van thing, um, is what we were in the whole time because you don't want to be not in the van thing when these guys are around. Um, but like the baboons are just like on the street like this. Tons of animals are just like on the street like this. Um, and the baboons are more or less okay with you unless they're not okay with you. And then they just like start throwing things. They're very territorial. Um, when I was, I was in Honduras briefly, and I had like baboons chase us because we accidentally walked through their territory. Um, um, but you should check out wild dogs. I didn't know about this at all, by the way, but Kruger National Park, which is where all these pictures are from, is in South Africa, and there are, the 600 might be a little bit low-balling it, but they are like a completely dying thing, um, and uh, they're really rare to see. They never stop moving, and this one is injured, actually, which is sad, but cool, because I got to see a thing that barely exists. I don't know how I feel about that, um, but yeah. Um, any questions, comments, wisecracks? So my ninth grade teacher used to say. Um, no, we, we, well, we started profiling a bunch of things like a couple of days before, and so yeah, um, it is. There's a bunch of them. Um, any bot, and then Ed might pull this off the top of his head better. Um, there's a couple of them that do look really cool. Have you ever used any bot? Or? I don't know, um, Rami, how did you feel about me being like, hey, call people for me? <laughs> um, so Rami was, was generally the person who, he was the one who got Hangouts, because there's a couple of people that would struggle with Hangouts for some reason, um, and so I would just be like, Rami, call this person, and he became like quickly the default person. Um, I think really it does, it just comes down to everyone owning it. Uh, I mean, like this, like make this your own. Like your company can't have remote workers and this not be part of your culture. Like you just can't do that. Like you will lose the employee. Like that's the bottom line. Um, and so yeah, like I mean, if they're remote for a couple of weeks or a couple of days or you know, it's not gonna be part of your culture. Um, though, I think if you're thinking about people being remote, it's probably better to think about it now, and like make people use this AnyBot. You know, make people cart an AV cart around. Um, or else, seriously, guys, like, it's, it can get really bad. Um, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks very much, Matthew.